Hello? Hi. Hello? Hello? I like subjectivity. It just doesn't have to be my own. New York City poet Rob Finneman wrote this maxim over a decade ago. And his work continues to investigate ways in which found language can create a collective articulation of effect. He's got wonderful books um, like No, Wait, Yep, Definitely Still Hate Myself. And uh, you may recognize this as uh, the Nirvana album, Never Mind. But this is Never Mind by Rob Fiddleman. Quite amazing. And what's also amazing, I've done everything in the wrong order. I was supposed to start with housekeeping. So we're going to go back a little. <laughs> OK. These are the fire exits. OK, there and there. So if there's a fire, go that way and that way. And you gather outside Cafe Nero and get a cappuccino if you want one. OK. Um, I was also supposed to talk about their lecture series. This is um, the Inside Out lecture series. Um, it's a senior lecture series that goes across the whole school of Leeds School of Arts. There's 4,500 students. And um, this is a lecture series specifically for the Leeds School of Arts students, but people from other schools are more than welcome. The general public is also welcome. And the idea was, was to get the best minds of our generation from around the world to come and speak to us. And we've definitely done that today um, with Professor Rob Fiddleman from New York University. And there are 60 of these lectures online because they're being filmed by the amazing film crew Lumen in Leeds. And there are 60 of these online on the Inside Out LARC website. So do have a look for them and go back through some of the previous lectures. There's some really, really amazing uh, speakers. So, okay, without any further ado, hello? Hello? <laughs> I'm starting again. But um, um, where had I got to? Um, I'm super massively thrilled. Um, I found out this new word, super massive, recently from our mutual friend, Christian Bock. I didn't know such a word existed. Apparently, it's to do with um, black holes. And apparently, if you go inside a black hole, you get spaghettified. So maybe uh, after your Rob's talk today, you'll be a bit spaghettified, which means every part of you is extruded out in different directions. But um, you know, I really want to welcome this amazing speaker. He's a great friend, a great poet, and we're very, very lucky to have him here at Leeds Beckett University. So please, load up on guns. Bring your friends. Rob Fiddleman. Uh, thank you, Simon. And um, I like that Simon's suggesting that you get a cappuccino during a fire. That's uh, my kind of guy. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Simon, and everyone here for, uh, for having me. Uh, thank you for coming. It would be pretty weird without you. So um, <laughs> thanks. Um, we're going to have a, probably be a little bit different than um, some of the other Inside Out ser in the series. I'm going to talk um, about uh, my work leading up to this moment uh, for about 20 minutes. And then we're going to have, an, because I'm a poet, we're going to have an old-fashioned poetry reading. Um, and I'm going to read from a very, very new work uh, that's in, in progress. Um, before I do that, though, to kick things off, um, let's see where I'm at here. I'm going to show you a uh, a brief uh, video. Uh, that's uh, it's an introduction uh, to me. It's all about me, and um, should answer any questions that you have in an introductory way.
that's every transition that was available in 2010. Um, and it's really everything you need to know about me. I have to say that um, one of the things w with the new um, keynote, as if people still use keynote, right? Um, sorry, load up. Uh, yeah, so one of the things about um, Keynote in 2010 when it, when it got updated, I lost about five transitions and I, I felt like my personality uh, shrank a little bit. I felt like I was a more complex person. Um, and then all of a sudden, there, what, like in one case there's a very long pause. Um, that, was a, that was a transition that no longer exists. Um, so it made me feel uh, edited. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about my work and give a sense of, of how I've arrived uh, where I am, just kind of bouncing around a lot. Um, yeah, I have 14 books, and they're all uh, very different, but in all of those books, um, each book is one text, one poem. Um, I still insist on calling them poems, even though sometimes they don't look or sound like poetry uh, per se. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I want to show you a, a little bit of, of some things um, that I've been up to. And I want to go all the way back to um, a pre-digital moment, um, pre-web, where I was working very much in a cut-and-paste style, uh, but real cut-and-paste. Um, so I would, for real, cut out... Um, I used to keep a paper bag of little pieces of language that I would cut out from newspapers, journals, ranging from a lot of sports journals, a lot of fashion magazines, good housekeeping, guns and ammo, lots of things I might not normally buy. Um, and I would paste them into um, some classic literature, in this case, Milton. I collected a lot of these standard English classics from the turn of the century. Um, they're beautiful little paperbacks. They're like really quite small. Not paperbacks, hardbacks, sorry. Uh, but they're very small. And um, as I was doing this, I discovered that um, I really like the look. So they, I, they, you know, I could have just kind of typed these out and had a collage poem. And of course, I was influenced by a lot of people that have been, had been doing this. Uh, from William Burroughs to David Bowie. Um, and I was interested in sampling and, and all those things that could have made the text, um, you know, pretty straight up collage. But I got really interested in whatever kind of visual effect it might also have. You could see that there is a lot of just old fashioned blackout, um, erasure poetry. And I purposefully liked it when it was a little funky, right? A little bit ugly. Um, and, um, and you see the patina of the original sources, which interests me. Um, for instance, this particular one um, from Milton, um, El Penseroso, uh, which sounded to me like um, a cowboy movie. Uh, so I... I I thought about that in, in the text. I have, you know, a whole book in this, uh, but I just thought I'd show you a few pages. Um, this one has got more corporate language, and uh, this last one uses uh, the Valley of the Dolls, um, the famous uh, 60s uh, American novel um, that has um, housewives doing a lot of prescribed drugs, um, as an example. Somewhere else meant than meets the ear, pale career, civil suited, tricked, the attic boy. That's all Milton. All the while, the reception phone is ringing, or hushered, the gust hath blown, timeless, classic gloom sights. Here I was on this conference call after church services, begins to fling his flaring beams, me, a fan of Jimmy Dean's, of Twilight Groves, 
and skill verging on monumental oak, a strange land where the rude acts as exhilarating or downright fumbling with the end. This is the story of the legal and moral recognition of women's right to love and still remain respectable. Her flowery note you keep changing, validating the look of love. The secretary rubbed his stubbly chin, trained male attendant on duty, dream all in one machines, like to see his private office portraiture softly on my eyelids laid like white on rice. Um, if I were back in New York, my students would be like, you know, I don't, I don't get it. And um, I'm always sort of saying to them, you don't get what? There's nothing to get. I, I know we've had this training where, like, you're supposed to get things, right? But, like, I don't listen to, like, music and, and try to get it, um, whether it's Mozart or Future. I don't really, that's not what I'm listening for. So... I, I, I would like to just keep that in mind while I talk about some other things. Um, as I was saying in the morning class on Monday with Simon, um, don't privilege sense over nonsense. And what I like in this early work is that I'm interested in both. Uh, and I think that's kind of true in most of my work. Um, it goes in and out of having sense. You know, like, oh, that, that kind of sounds like something I might say. Um, and challenging or tripping up that sense uh, with a very intentional kind of nonsense. Feel like, you you know, nonsense is good. There's a lot of it. You're in a rich tradition if you are down with being uh, nonsensical. I find it um, very freeing. Um, yeah, anyway, so that was a project that I did before the web and, and um, um, right around that time, I would say maybe in the mid-90s, um, I started to move into using cut and paste by borrowing a lot of, of uh, material online. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, a little bit later. Um, most of my work, you'll see in this arc, uh, comes from found material. I'm interested in using found material. Um, many artists are interested in, in repurposing or recycling um, found materials. Um, I would say that, as Simon pointed to in his introduction, I'm interested in using found material, but also reaching for a kind of emotionality, a kind of personal. Like, how can it be personal if I didn't write it? That interests me. Um, and uh, it interests me in a way that I think of the lyric poem. Um, the lyric poem is usually a, a, a moment of emotional uh, exuberance, in the, in the really rough paraphrase of Wordsworth who's rolling over in his grave as I speak. Um, trust me, he is. I could, I could see it. I'm sorry, William. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in like capturing that kind of emotional lyric moment uh, in text that I didn't necessarily write. I composed, I called, I conceptualized, but I, I didn't actually write. So for instance, in this, um, and this might not seem personal to you, um, but um, um, there's nothing here that I actually wrote, right? There's stuff Milton wrote, there's stuff that comes from fashion magazines and Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, but I didn't actually write it. And um, that will bring me to a more challenging work that I very much did not write, but very much composed which is this big book of over 700 pages of um, Nirvana's Nevermind. Um, so what's happening in this book, and it's so heavy that I'm traveling from New York and, and moving on, I couldn't even put it in my bag, so I'm very happy Simon brought a copy. Um, I just took a picture. And... Um, so what this is, is a relaxed or paused or slowed down um, compilation, not really compilation, uh, appropriation of uh, every utterance of the album from Nirvana's Nevermind, from beginning to end. Uh, so there's no titles of the songs because they didn't speak that uh, on, the, on the album. 
Um, well, you, you might ask, like, why would you do such a thing? Um, and I don't know if I want to give you the answer, but I will tell you that every, po every page of the poem, and you'll see it in a minute, is uh, very minimal. There's usually between one and eight words per page. Uh, every choice that I had to make about how many words would be on a page was grueling, was intense. I, it took me years to do this project. Wh like, why would I have eight words and not four words? Why, why would I break a line and have two lines? I could have one line, right? So these are the things poets think about. But some of you are, are working with text, and uh, the more you think about text, the more techniques you have, the more you get introduced to maybe the more you um, find it useful. Uh, that's the teacher in me. Um, yeah, so I think Simon, I think we want to get a little bit of Nevermind in our mind. Um, you want to play? A, a, oh, no, you know what we'll do instead? Everybody, how many people know, first of all, how many people know this album? Excellent, almost everybody, good. Uh, so an anthem of this album is Smells Like Teen Spirit, right? First song in the album. Can we collectively hum a little bit of Team Spirit? I, I, I know you could do it. Let's do it on five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> Let's go to the chorus. Hello, hello, hello. Okay, good. Perfect. Um, now you might um, you might wonder, you might not, but you might you might think I'm like a huge Nirvana fan. I am not. Um, I am totally neutral. That's almost the reason. One of the reasons why I chose Nirvana was that I don't dislike them, but I don't really like them that much. They're fine. They're a good rock and roll band, but uh, it's not my thing. I have friends who are like huge Nirvana fans, um, and they ask me about this, and I'm like, I like it okay. Um, and the, the reason why that works for me is I'm, I'm really kind of bouncing off of, of Duchamp talking about uh, choosing his ready-mades, and he, he, he would say, um, you should really choose an object that you feel neutral about, because if you love it too much, it's going to be an homage, and if you... Uh, if, you, if you despise it, it's going to be a parody. It's going to be a cynical parody, right? Which would be obvious. So for me, like if, this, if I did this with like Britney Spears, um, everybody would think like, oh, he's really, this is hilarious. He's ripping her apart. But there's really nothing funny when you get inside my never mind. Um, there's really nothing, it's not especially funny. Um, and if this were something I loved, uh, like Blonde on Blonde, which is probably my favorite album of all time, uh, it would just feel like idolatry. So um, I chose something that I like, okay, you know. It's, it, so when I slowed down the lyrics and I was looking at them as poems, and I didn't, get to, I didn't change any of the words at all, right? I just rearranged them. Um, there are moments that are like, wow, this is like, you know, this is really good writing. And there are other moments where it's like, wow, this is really awful, you know? And so I kind of had to uh, think about how to make it my own without thinking too much about um, um, Kurt Cobain. Um, right? So you can see what it looks like. Load up. On guns, bring your friends. It's fun to lose and to pretend she's over. Bored self. Like, for instance, I don't think Kurt Cobain ever really wanted to have an emphasis on bored self, but I did, you know, so I'm taking something 
that already existed and I'm trying to make a new thing. Assured. Oh no, I know. Hello. 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 How low? How low? Hello. 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 So whether it, you know, and, and um, I'm going to read the next uh, 700 pages, and so it'll take about an hour and a half. No, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Whoa, no, wait, I got class. Um, I, what, uh, what I want to emphasize is that there are a lot of choices um, here. Whether you, you know, like them or not, you have to recognize that there were choices. Um, and for instance, uh, stacking the three there was uh, something that visually appealed to me, but also it has a diff different rhythm. Um, you know, operating thinking like a poet, um, those are going to be a little faster. Um, this has got a different feeling, obviously, than that page, right? And so every page is like that. Every page uh, has a lot of choices, um, and each one of those choices is informed by the kind of uh, poet I am, the kind of book I want to make, and those kinds of things. Um, so as an appropriation project, obviously this is a, uh, a big one. Um, and um, go through these pages a little bit. Um, so I want to bring this up to, a, you know, there are a lot of different projects that are happening in between um, these, but I, I'll just sort of start to bring us up to the present. Um, so this book is about eight years ago called uh, No Wait, Yep, Definitely Still Hate Myself. And um, I was interested, as Simon also briefly mentioned in the introduction, I was increasingly interested in an idea that we can use uh, not only appropriated um, material from uh, corporations or institutions or literature, but you can also have access to how everybody's feeling all the time, right, online. Um, people express their feelings a lot. And um, I was kind of going through a hard period myself, and I, I started thinking about um, Everybody seems to use the same language when we're talking about sadness, loneliness, depression. It really felt kind of finite to me. Like the pool of vocabulary kind of felt the same in Hollywood and in pop songs and in literature and online, in chat rooms, etc. Um, so I started writing this piece, and it very much looks like poetry, by the way. Um, I'll just hold it up here for a minute, which isn't what a lot of my work looks like, but it echoes a, a particularly sad poem by uh, James Schuyler called The Morning of the Pope. Um, it looks like verse. It could be like 19th century, right? It looks like verse. And I wanted that because I wanted to uh, emphasize that poetry tends to be this kind of the field of affect, of, uh, where we bring our emotions. Um, so I started to uh, think about how I might uh, collect a, uh, a, a, a book, really almost like a rant of um, expressions of, uh, of uh, sadness, uh, depression, and loneliness. Um, the tricky thing, of course, for me in this project was to make it one voice. So uh, to go polyvocal into a univocal, um, because in, in here, and I'm going to read a little bit of it, um, there's probably two or three hundred voices that are all made into one person. So I massaged this language very much, but I found it, a lot of it was on Instagram, a lot of it was uh, other social media. Um, where I, just did a, I just would do searches for sadness and loneliness uh, for years. Wasn't that much fun, by the way. 
<laughs> this was a project I couldn't work on for more than an hour a day, uh, hour at a time. It, it, it got kind of depressing. Um, the book is, you know, at times hilarious, I think, uh, and at times super sad. Um, and um, uh, I, I ultimately, I think what, what, where I'm going with this is that I felt like it was a kind of chorus, a kind of collective voice, right? That we can all, you know, kind of collectively have this feeling. And I would just be an actor in that. I would be a, 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 a receiver. Um, it, you know, and there's a lot of, I try to handle the material very sensitively. Uh, a lot of people uh, appreciate that. A lot of people, other people, you know, get pissed off at me, uh, thinking that I'm, I, that it's not sensitive. Um, but I think of it a little bit like, um, you know, when we see Charlie Chaplin or some Charlie Chaplin plays a character uh, who might be extremely sad, vagabond. Doesn't mean Charlie Chaplin was that. Uh, but, you know, uh, poets and artists and novelists. Uh, for centuries have obviously taken on characters and, and presented them. When it comes to poetry, it's a little more challenging somehow, right? People think uh, poetry should be uh, just my personal expression. But I like to think of my personal expression is really no greater than anyone else's personal expression. Um, what I do best, I think, is put it together and bring it forward, not elevate my personal expression over yours, right? You probably have uh, articulated feelings much more deeply uh, than I have. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down. And uh, begin sort of the second part of this. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I did that prematurely. I wanted to show you something else. Okay, good. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but I'm going to read a little bit from No Wait. No Wait, yep, definitely still hate myself. Uh, I'll just start no matter what I do. I never seem to be satisfied. The world spins around me, and I feel like I'm looking in from the outside. I go get a donut. I sit in my favorite part of the park, but that's not the point. The point is that I feel socially awkward and seem to have trouble making friends, which makes me very sad and lonely indeed. I'm way too sensitive and I always feel like no one likes me. I don't know what to do. I'm just super tired of feeling this way. I used to really like people. I wasn't always imagining the Coney Island roller coaster ride as, you know, a metaphor for my life. I'm happy in the morning, yet at night, I'm sad and lonely and depressed, and above all, I'm starting to feel like nobody cares about me. Once upon a time, I was super popular. I was the class clown. I was a riot. I got caught tossing our seventh grade science books out of the second floor window. People loved me. I was happy and crazy, but now I'm like a lonely flute. I used to blow off everyone who wanted to talk or hang out at school. Now look at me. Now I'm the one nobody wants to talk to. Somebody said, if you think reading poetry can be sad and lonely, just try writing it. And don't kid yourself. From this anguish and utter helplessness, people do not emerge and find a sense of peace. I started reading someone's Tumblr about feeling all lonely and whatever. It's totally stupid sounding. But then I actually felt exactly the same way, even though I know it sounds totally stupid, and that's what poetry is. Believe me, I'm not some happy-go-lucky person telling you things will get better. I'm just super lonely, and I don't really care about whose version of loneliness is more severe or worse or more legit or real. And by real, what do we mean anyway, please? I'm in a gift shop holding a silver, brightly colored bag of freeze-dried astronaut ice cream, which is totally sad and depressing and ridiculous. I keep reaching for something big, but every time all I find is a great void and an empty feeling of the impossible. It's the saddest and loneliest feeling in the world. And if it isn't, then you can tell me what is. You're dumb, you're ugly, you're not talented, you're not smart, you suck, you dress like shit, 
Your so-called friends aren't worth your time. You're a failure. Okay, you got it. That's me. No, wait. Yep, definitely still hate myself. Sometimes there's nothing to do. Sometimes I wish I were a cat. Sometimes all you need is a little dark room where you can wipe your butthole on the carpet. A lot of people are in this funk right now, distressed about the election results, no work, about how to get how their home got washed away, on and on. No surprise if you're picking up on that energy. I often wish I were a kid again. I can honestly say my life was a hundred times better than, than it is today. I'm sad and lonely and I hate everything. There's a show that I like to watch called House starring Hugh Laurie, and today they had on some reruns. There's a two-parter from a couple of years ago that I really enjoyed watching. The first episode is called House's Head, and the second one, Wilson's Heart. I want to tell you about these shows, but you need to have seen them, or at least know about House. But this is what my life has come to, telling you about TV reruns. I'm aware of this, and I know how pathetic it sounds. Life is so unfair. I wonder why people like me exist. I don't get it. I'm lonely, lonely, lonely. I was born lonely. I am best so. The way I see the world is on another level. And this is because of my mental sadness, which has been with me for so many years. Sorry to say, but our minds are worlds apart, and no matter how hard you try, you will lose yourself within your own thoughts and suffer because of that futile attempt. And here's another really sad factor. I'm totally imagining who this you might be. I guess one could say it's a fantasy because I'm not really talking to anyone, I'm not really relating to anyone, and it's not like I'm going out and meeting anyone, so when I say you, I don't really know who I am addressing, and isn't that doubly sad and pathetic? Of course, you don't have to answer that because there really isn't a you, and I don't even know who that you would be if there were one. The pain is tremendous. The agony that lies inside my mind just seems to overwhelm my physical pain. And then my emotions, these feelings, they only feed on my mind, which makes things worse. The lonesome star is faded into the grave of cosmic storms. The dying rays of silver light all form the sign of Satan's rise, falling dead star, crashing God's throne, spinning heaven's death rings as king. Fire burning, cosmos freezing, portal opens, gloomy altars, night of the black sorrowful moaning, winds blowing through these melancholic woods. How I feel so dead here, sad and cold, as I hear crip sounds of moan. Only thoughts of sorrow bring me down to the pits of this bottomless black. In this endless tomb of weeping sadness, I am embraced by the cosmic force of night. Pain dooming, death coming, shadows of misery are cast on the full moon. Light and stars of hellfire shine like a blinding bolt of lightning dying alone in the wood, woodlands, isolated in my empire of solitary death, total sadness, total darkness, total coldness, total pain. That's the end of the book, by the way, and um, that's ripped just totally from a uh, death metal lyric. Um, yeah, but before we get too much into that head, let me switch gears and talk about a new project that has a couple of slides I want you to see. Um, okay, good, so we're, we're up to the present. Um, I'm up to the present, and uh, I've been working on a project for many years that I want to share with you. Uh, I've only read it once or twice, so it's exciting for me. Um, it requires a little bit of explanation um, while we look at this waterfall from Patterson, New Jersey. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give as much context as I can. Uh, can you hear me okay without the mic? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Um, so, I've been working on a piece called Creep Core, 
And Crivecore is, uh, for those of you who speak French, Crivecore uh, is Broken Heart. Uh, but it's also the name of the town I grew up in, uh, which is a small, lower middle class suburb of St. Louis uh, that was developed in the very early 1960s. Um, alongside of that, let's keep that in mind, alongside of that, um, I was very much interested in and involved during, uh, before COVID and during COVID, uh, in reading William Carlos Williams' masterwork, uh, Patterson. And this is a uh, picture of the falls in Patterson, New Jersey. So, Patter so William Carlos Williams, uh, I know most of, many of you, most of you, if not all of you, are uh, visual arts students and might not know that name. Um, William Carlos Williams was one of the great uh, American modernists um, writing uh, in the 1910s uh, initially. Um, and um, at writing these kind of Dada uh, minimalist poems that are quite beautiful. And then he spent the second half of his life, in the 1940s to the 60s, working on this long masterwork called Patterson. Um, and Patterson um, is a collection of, of um, journalistic uh, news stories about this town in Patterson, New Jersey. It's about an hour from New York City. Um, and it's where he lived. Now, the, one, one interesting thing about Williams is that all of his buddies, Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, and others, were uh, running off to Europe and being in the lost generation of the 1920s. <coughs> Williams was a pediatrician and stayed in New Jersey and had a lot of feelings about a kind of investment in American culture at a time when that was not popular. Right? <coughs> so this investment in American culture led him to this masterwork um, five books, 300 pages, called Patterson. And in Patterson, there's this great uh, waterfall. Um, and uh, again, he tries to create a kind of American zeitgeist, a kind of American cosmos uh, of that particular moment in the middle of the 20th century um, of a kind of hard scrabble working class town um, and its history. He tries to do something where he creates a pastiche between the journalism and documentary and archive stuff and the verse that reflects that. So, getting back to Creve Corps, I decided I was going to uh, recast Patterson as Creve Corps, uh, literally. Like, uh, so I have the same number of lines, uh, I have the same indentation. Eat any page of Patterson, it looks like a mirror to my page, or, or at least as close as I can can go. Um, and I also try to translate his themes into a kind of 80s consumer culture of, uh, of my town, Creve Corps. Um, I would just add two things. One is that we both have waterfalls. Um, mine is very tiny in Creve Corps, but it is famous. Uh, it's how Creve Corps got its name, supposedly a Native American woman, and um, I believe it was Laclede, who was a famous French fur trapper, uh, were in love. And um, of course, it ended badly. And she suicided into the lake off of the falls. It's probably total. I mean, this is a story of so many lakes in the US that it's somewhat ridiculous. But maybe it happened, maybe it didn't. Anyway, it's in the poem. Um, so we share that similarity, um, Williams and I. And um, the other thing I wanted to point out before I show you a couple slides, um, my history um, in Creve Corps, uh, I think, is tied very much into a very racist, very ugly racist history in St. Louis. St. Louis has had a long, um, a long history of especially anti-black racism. And um, where, I, where my parents grew up, for instance, it, which is in uh, North, North St. Louis, um, is um, uh, a very impoverished black neighborhood since the 1950s. St. Louis served as a prototype for uh, uh, white flight um, uh, red, and redlining, which are things that come up a little bit in this as well. Um, so that history is very important. That racial history replaces a lot of the kind of um, uh, 
worker revolt history that is in uh, Williams's Patterson. Um, and so to some degree, this was propelled. Uh, so Ferguson, Missouri, which might ring a bell for some of you because of Michael Brown, um, is a stone's throw away from where I grew up. Um, okay, good. So I want to show you a couple slides, and then we're going to have like an old-fashioned poetry reading, as I promised. Um, I'm not a visual artist. I am a poet. Nobody's perfect. Um, and um, yeah, so we'll have an old-fashioned poetry reading. I hope it won't... Uh, Okay, so this is, so that, again, just to see this, so this is much more grand. Uh, this is the, the falls at Patterson. I recommend it. No one goes there that I know. I'm always asking people, have you ever been to the waterfall in Patterson? And people are like, I no. Um, so it's really quite cool. Have you been there? No. Have you seen the film? Yeah. Yes. About the film? Yeah. The film on Patterson? Yeah. 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 What, what do you think about it? Adam Driver is a... Yeah, it's kind of okay. They did some <laughs> weird things. Like, I don't know why they didn't use Williams's poetry, but instead they used um, somebody else. I can't remember Ron who. Patchett? Yeah. yeah, and they used Ron Patchett. Exactly. Which I thought was weird. Like, why bother? Um, it didn't have much to do with the book at all, but it was kind of, it was kind of okay. I like Jim Jarmusch in general, so what about you? Did you like it? Yeah. Mm. Well, it's Jim Jarmusch. I saw it on a plane, and uh, you know, I'm I'm like, I don't know what it is about flying and watching movies. I'm like ready to cry, at like um, you know comedy, um, and the fact that I didn't get too choked up over it suggested to me that it wasn't like working for me. But uh, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. So there's a film called, is it called Patterson? It's just called Patterson. Yeah. yeah. He's a bus driver, not a pediatrician. Yeah. And also, those of you who are fans of Robert Smithson. Uh, might recognize Patterson and these falls. Um, Smithson um, talks about quite a lot. And Smithson was, as a child, a patient of William Carlos Williams, which is kind of amazing. Um, and then they met later in life uh, when Smithson was um, quite well known. And um, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. So. <laughs> this is the falls at Creve Coeur. Um, and you can see they're not quite so grand, um, but that is a very uh, Missouri kind of autumn. Um, you know, there's something about it that's kind of gray and green and kind of okay at the same time. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's the falls where I come from. I mean, we used to just kind of go, there. this is a park very close to where I grew up, and, you know, we used to just kind of go there and get stoned, and um, look at the falls. Listen to really bad music. Um, right, so there's uh, my copy of the actual book that I'm following page by page, and um, there's that artist rendition of the falls, which I always thought the falls looked like that until I saw them. They don't really look like that very much. Um, you know, you could compare that with that. I don't know. Well, there you go. Um, right, so there's a page from Patterson and a page from my book, uh, Creve Core, and you can see, um, you know, they're pretty close. Um, they're not exact, but they're pretty close. And in fact, um, this is an earlier version, so I kind of going back and I'm like getting kind of crazy and I'll be like, oh, actually there's two lines there, so I have to, I need another line there. But there are, you know, the, I have to do the same number of lines because um, it messes up the pagination, right, mm -hmm. if I don't have the exact number of lines. And I, at one point I was talking to a poet friend of mine and he was like, you know, why don't you just let that go? I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it, you, you'll feel better about, no one's going to know. No one's going to, and I really, I, I was really like, no, it's like a translation. I really want it to be like a translation, you know, like you should have, and it's like, I don't know, you know, there's like five people in the world that will actually look at this face to face. So I said, oh, you're right, 
I need to, I should do that. I think it would be more liberating and I should do it. And I tried to do it and I didn't like it because it felt like every choice I was making was arbitrary. It, they just didn't feel right. And so I went back to doing it this way and it, it it's really, it's, it creates a kind of poetry that, uh, you know, kind of sounds and feels like the 1940s um, American modernist poetry which I embraced in this project. Like there's a lot of that language and that kind of attention syllabically uh, that you'll, you'll hear hopefully when I read it. So that's, uh, that's the beautiful town of Creve Coeur. Um, I think that's kind of typical. Um, I took ballet uh, for one month um, at that studio it kind of didn't have that facade at the time. I don't know why I took ballet. <laughs> it was really confusing to me. Um, I saw a Merce Cunningham performance, and it kind of blew my mind. And somebody told me, like, you should do ballet before you do modern. Like, you should learn, like, classical guitar before you, like, start shredding some metal, you know? And it was bad advice. <laughs> I was really bad at it. Um, I did go on to be interested in modern dance, but anyway, I just thought that that, that pretty much tells you all you need to know about Creve Corps. It's really ugly. It's really kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, flat, and, uh, and it's hot, extremely hot. It's landlocked. It's, in a very, it, it's, like, it's oppressively hot. Uh, and what they say in St. Louis is it's not the heat, it's the humility. <laughs> okay, good. So I'm going to read for about 15 minutes or so. Um, anyone? We're going to have some questions and maybe answers later. Uh, but if anyone wants to slow me down, feel free. Okay. Here we go. So the poetry reading part of our evening has been brought to you by Simon Morris Incorporated. <laughs> Creve Coeur, preface. Creve Coeur, loosely broken heart in French, a sleepy, broken hearted suburb of St. Louis. Pocahontas is the seventh member of the Disney princess lineup. In short, the movie is about how shipwrecked British settlers land in the New World and meet the enchanting Pocahontas. One of the young, handsome settlers, Mel Gibson's voice, falls hopelessly in love with the beautiful Pocahontas. A nightmare occurs and the lovers seek out the advice of Grandma Willow, a spiritual talking tree. After some disputes and violence, the dashing white settler hero has to return to England, and the lovers are both broken-hearted. In the final scene, Pocahontas waves goodbye to the ship from the top of a jagged cliff. This is basically the same story of how my hometown suburb, Creve Coeur, got its broken-hearted name, except this version features a French fur trapper, and a Native American woman, and it ends in her suicide. The story goes like this. When a broken-hearted Osage woman leapt to her death off the waterfall and into the Creve Coeur Lake, the lake then formed a broken heart shape. Mmm, the face of the falls crumbles. A thin stream trickles gently down its face like the steps of a Roman amphitheater, slick with some vague Missouri silt green scum. Without much thought, the Creve Coeur waterfall, sometimes called Dripping Springs, is for lovers. But this waterfall is not very steep. It never seemed ideal to me or even possible for a suicide, lovesick or otherwise. Power walking changes lives. The best way to describe power walking is to think of it as a low impact alternative to jogging. Basically, it takes regular walking and ups the intensity. 
If you put two walkers next to each other and told one to move at a moderate pace with their arms at their side and told the other to increase their speed while simultaneously pumping their arms, that's the basic technique. Known in these parts, the Crevecore walker powers up the sidewalks at dawn in the softest of soft shoes, speeding past sleepy residents who are nestled in their soft bedrooms in the softest homes on earth. Powering onto the sprawling Monsanto headquarters campus, the walker fiddles with his walkman and breathes it all in as managers, engineers, lawyers, and chemists start strolling into the vast parking lot. Swoosh is the sound of the walker's polycotton tracksuit, also called tipped fleece, a deep burgundy offset nicely by his stark white, just out of the box, New Balance. He picks up his pace, powering onto the sidewalk at Schnucks Supermarket, onward past McDonald's and into a future Crevecore. I should have mentioned in Patterson there's a character who walks around as a kind of flaneur and mine is a power walker. Do you have that term for exercise? Book one, Schnucks, a giant among supermarkets. This is why I don't do self-checkout. I was at Schnucks with my dad and he was overcharged for two out of ten things. This happens almost every time we do self-checkout. Dad is somewhat hard of hearing and occasionally impatient, so I get it when he insists on doing self-checkout, but then I'm the one who has to stand in line at customer service and unload everything onto the counter. Ragu pasta sauce was three for five dollars. Dad got three, but was charged eight dollars. Chicken sausages were buy one, get one free. Dad got four and was charged for four. It's embarrassing. And to top everything else off, Dad bought a bad batch of flowers, and since it wasn't on his Schnucks rewards card, they made him jump through hoops to exchange it. Now, my dad's a sweetheart, but highly principled, and if crossed, he's known to slam a bouquet of roses onto the service counter, and everyone acts like there's been some misunderstanding. Once upon a time, I worked at this Crevecore store, and once when I was out back for a cigarette break, I set free a gold helium balloon trapped behind a dumpster. In bubbly cursive, it read, Best Day Ever. From above, higher than the Schnook's rooftop, high enough to make out the crack in the heart-shaped lake, higher than the Schnook's dumpsters and the fading yellow lines on the asphalt, the shiny balloon, long hair flowing, unrequited love suicide, mangled in the dead leaves, plastic bags and dried weeds, a tiny man, ancient, shouting, twisting in the wind. The other side of the balloon reads... Grand opening, every new mall, like a fresh start. Back then, there was a manager named Zach who'd intentionally hide trash in corners to see if I was sweeping up properly. Hmm, I think you missed this area. A man like that, whose hair is very much in place, like a tulip, knows how to bring an MDA, MBA degree to grocery store management. Zach used to boast he's worked in nearly every Schnucks location, either helping out or trending new hires. He's seen good store management and bad store management. It usually depends on the area. Zach claimed that he wasn't prejudiced, but that the stores in North County, like in Ferguson or Spanish Lake, just weren't as up to speed as the ones in West County. He said that nearly every one of those stores had horrible deli departments. Zach would tell horror stories, like when deli meats were dropped on the floor and then wiped off because the butchers felt like it was too much hassle to cut more. Everything depended, Zach said, on the neighborhood. Hands spinning like sparrows at a small churchyard, the buzz of the register, the dance of the products. A few years ago, I helped my parents out of their small suburban home with a yard in Creve Core and into an independent living apartment building. The concept of the doggy poop bag had to be introduced for their Karen Terrier. I offered to go to Schnucks. 
The brightly lit breakfast cereal aisle was haunted with my old world uncles floating above the products like cigar smoke, one proudly showing his labor party card, another in a pressed shirt with his tie on, pushing a lawnmower across a Captain Crunch box, other relatives projected as a home movie inside their North St. Louis one-bedroom apartment, fading, blinds drawn, complaining about too much light. I grew up thinking lightly Brit lit homes equal wealth. I find a worker pricing soup can cans and ask where the doggy bags might be. He looked at me bewildered. Takeaway bags? No, poop bags, I say too loudly. Oh, yeah, pretty sure we don't carry those. I wobble back to the Camry. It's literally 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit and very still. Once inside the car, the land dissolves into a slow-motion carousel of fine lawns juiced with Monsanto's Roundup Weed Killer. What's not to love? Something like a tear rolls down the face of the falls, Secrets hidden in the cracks, promissory notes, eminent domain, sleazy subprime mortgages. What is the best word to go with sadness? Sorrow. Everyone's got trouble sometimes. Nobody has troubles like mine. I head west on Ledoux Road past the haves, whose futures look bright, whose families have thrived in the Ledoux School District, then pass some sad, forgotten 70s condos units where two grown-ass men are enjoying a front patio lounge with Bud Light koozies. Life is sweet, reads one t-shirt. I hate everything, reads the other. Life like from the George Strait song, a kind of consolation prize. Or as my dad used to say, a constellation prize. Put the Kreef Corps namesake myth next to this more damaging one. By 1950, St. Louis City had reached its peak population, forcing returning soldiers to look for housing in counties like Kreef Corps. Wage earners wanted bigger homes, more yard space, and places to park their new cars. The automobile industry had a vision of two cars for every suburban family, one for dad to go to work and one for mom to drive to the market or to the kids' activities. The new affordability in the auto automobile industry, along with the construction of highways, pushed the westward movement away from downtown. And that expansion to the suburbs myth next to the real Harlan Bartholomew urban planner whose vision was renovation by demolition. For Bartholomew, the bulldozer was the best tool for post-war urban planning. In 1939, St. Louis approved his proposal to demolish over 20 square miles of inner-city inner real estate. Over 400 apartment buildings and houses, mostly renters, mostly black families. And with the destruction of those homes also came the destruction destruction of a bohemian culture of bookstores, jazz clubs, coffee houses, demolishing what was once term, termed the Greenwich Village of the West. To this day, massive stretches of downtown St. Louis remain either scorched or poorly developed. One-story buildings stand alone on empty lots under the looping highways headed west to the suburbs. Everybody has roots. Up here, a cop points to a sign nailed to a tree. Here lies the city. Good technique requires focus, the power walker reminds himself. The body is tilted slightly forward from the basic standing position and the weight thrown on the ball of the foot. He crushes a dandelion on the, si on the sidewalk on Craig Road. What is love more than walking? The TGI Fridays with its peppermint striped awning already looks a bit tired after only a handful of years. Looking back on its festive grand opening in the Westgate Center, it felt like a big deal. I remember we had a buy one meal, get one free coupon from Schnooks, which added to the festive feeling all around. 
My dad got the steak and asked for the whiskey glaze on the side. It came with the whiskey glaze on top, of course. We anticipated a fuss, but after a weighty pause, he approved reluctantly, pushing the sauce around with his knife. A few minutes later, my Beyond Burger arrived. I ordered it. I ordered it medium rare, and let's just leave it at that. The next table was enjoying an oversized basket of nachos. They looked pretty good. Mom talked about family in Memphis and how hot it is there, how Uncle Meyer called my mom flea and how she liked whatever little attention she got. I suggested we try the nachos next time. Mom and Dad looked like some horrible news had just been delivered. Sorry, I even mentioned the nachos. And the blue raspberry lemonade was tempting no one at our table. The power walker has a lot on his mind. One clear advantage to an early morning walk, he reminds himself, is the chance to reflect. Outside of Furious 7, the entire Fast and Furious franchise is just so-so, he muses as he goes over the opening scene carnage. Two hospital workers huddled behind an EKG machine, an armed SWAT team slain and scattered about the hospital hallways, elevators, lobby, the sinister assassin casually walking away from the hospital, back turned to the grenade about to explode. Boom! Screeching away in his Jaguar F-type coupe R. The power walker shakes off the disparity between last night's movie and the quiet calm of his morning walk. He powers along the outer road of the unremarkable Creefcore golf course and recounts his list of chores. Number one is to take care of those weeds and pick up some Roundup. He pauses on this morning's article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. All those Monsanto statistics and the world's food supply and those Roundup cancer suits. There were 125,000 non-Hodgkin's lymphoma lawsuits, it says, against Monsanto, and they settled 100,000? That seems like a lot, he says. Who wants to hear that story again? The myth, the namesake, and suicide. Can it be told with pictures through the State Historical Society of Missouri? Their archives, county libraries, court documents. Can it be told through transcripts, revised transcripts? No one cares about who you are or who you say you are. They care about belonging and they care about who can accelerate that for them and who can blame them for wanting to feel like they belong and who yada, 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 the world is harsh and the comforts are few. One summer I worked as a sea hatch busboy, an upscale seafood restaurant in another mall called Westgate Plaza. The sea hatch menu reads, spawned in the clear waters of the oceans of the world and then tenderly harvested and air freighted to our doors. If you look about, we think you will notice how we combed the world literally to acquire many of our accoutrements. For example, our dining room tables are all ship hatches recovered from sunken vessels in the Caribbean, brought to St. Louis, sandblasted, and then treated with a special epoxy to expose the magnificent oak graining. Outstanding. Sometimes after my sea hatch shift ended around midnight, my brother would pick me up and take me downtown to Herbie's. In the 1970s, Herbie's was the gay disco on the Central West End neighborhood of St. Louis. My brother would sneak me in and we'd slide upstairs to the dance floor. For five dollars, you could buy a small, pop, a small bottle of amyl nitrate poppers from the DJ. Everybody had poppers. The dance floor swayed like a fish tank. One night there was a police raid and the DJ cut off Gloria Gaynor's Never Can Say Goodbye to announce everyone under age get out. No one left. Everyone started digging through their pockets for their Herbie's membership cards. After that night though, Herbie's became stricter and had a doorman. Everybody was required to show a Herbie's membership ID. 
The next time I went there, I was refused entry, and my brother had to call me a cab to go home. We agreed to have the driver drop me off a few blocks from our house. It would be scandalous to even see a taxi in Creve Court. A few years later, some of the managers at Herbie's died of AIDS, and they closed down shortly after. And a few years after that, my brother also died of AIDS. The Falls whispers, when you are born, you are soft and pliable. When Shirley Gold, who was born in downtown St. Louis and died in Creve Coeur, knew it was time to move into Brookdale Senior Living, she requested her kids help her with a garage sale. All paperback books were 25 cents, hardcover $1. Pots and pans were basically $1 to $4. All jeans, including her husband Leon's, who had died two years earlier, were $3. Purses were three to five dollars. Her daughter-in-law thought that price was especially low, but Shirley reminded her that none of them were expensive to start with, and she'd already set aside two purses for everyday use. Cassettes and CDs were all one dollar. Leon had a penchant for original film soundtracks. Leon's desktop computer was thirty dollars, and the printer was ten dollars. The kitchen table was twenty-five dollars, and another fifteen for the chairs. Shirley had a strong feeling about the kitchen table, lots of memories, but she knew it was too big for her Brookdale one bedroom, and she'd already picked out a new small one uh, with her son Don, who was going to pick it up at the mall next week. She priced all the shoes 3 to $10, which did give Shirley some pause because she often treated herself to finely made shoes, but she never wore them anymore. Book two, um, A Sunday in Creve Corps Memorial Park. We mosey around the parking lot near the falls. A few pizza boxes, Marlboros, bush beer, a guitar. It can almost be a picnic. Except for that one dude, his name escapes me, wasted on quaaludes, fl flicking a cigarette into the void. Balthazar, that kid's name was Balthazar, for real. But everyone called him Ballsy, which of course he didn't favor, or belief, because his father was a pastor. Though I also remember, I remember hearing him called Beef. Anyway, I'm told he runs a gun shop out of the Sunoco station in, in Crestwood. At night, legend has it the ghost of the broken-hearted woman appears under the falls, moaning, or on the surface of the lake, some say. Four orbs cross the night sky. One announces how fucked up he is and slams the Bronco truck door. Some lovers behind the bramble go silent and wait. This is the year we all got a little closer to death. Further along Olive Street Road is Denny's Restaurant. They have large windows that look out onto the parking lot, not ordinarily offering much of a view. A couple of bushes and a yucca plant landscaped with some rocks. But last summer, two MRI lab technicians from Metro Imaging West County walked in for lunch and were seated at the window table overlooking the bushes. Something caught their attention. Peeking out from behind the yucca plant was a human skull. It don't matter where you bury me, I'll be home for dinner and TV. A lullaby. I've never done good things. I've never done bad things. I never did anything out of the blue. Thank you.